Hello, hello. hello. <laughs> I was just waiting for you to say it. Welcome to Human Design Coffee Talk. Welcome, welcome. Today, we are, we decided that a lot of you, uh, a lot of our listeners have come over from Instagram. We used to do this live on Instagram and we took it over to podcast only. So we might have some listeners that have no idea what our definition is, um, what our background with human design is. And we just want to make sure that everybody who's listening understands the lens in which we are looking through and uh, how we might be conditioning you with our podcast. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Brandy is going to introduce herself with her design. Mm -hmm. And for those of you watching on YouTube, we are going to have our charts up <laughs> while we're talking about them. Boom. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. All right. Well, I am a four, six sacral manifesting generator. I am split definition. I have the 2145 split off of uh, 1034. I have channel of preservation, 2750, channel of struggle, 2838. Um, and that's me. Um, so I have a uh, four gates hanging off my solar plexus. I have a completely open head, undefined Ajna with only gate four hanging off of it. Uh, gate four is also in my Venus. Um, so yeah, th that's, that's, that's me. Um, my only fully conscious channel is channel of struggle. That is something that Teresa and I both have fully conscious. Um, I am D R R P R L. So I am right brain, right mind. I am um, passive in my environment. I am the observer and I have a focused view. So I'm probability view. I am shores artificial. I am feeling cognition and hope, motivation and acceptance sense. So yeah. Yeah. That's me. My conscious son is 39.4, um, which I think we, we might talk a little bit about gate 39 later today. Um, we have that in common. And I am a cross of tension. So for a long time, I have a defined ego. I'm cross of tension. 39 is my conscious son. Um, when Before I was introduced to human design, I was always told to like tame down my energy you know, don't be so provocative towards people, not like, not with my clothing, but just my energy. Don't be so intimidating. Um, think of others, right? I have 3410, but I also have channel of preservation. So I'm kind of always thinking about others, even if it doesn't look like it. And understanding my design when I was introduced to it in 29, at the end of 2019, um, and I started learning about my definition. I was like, wow, it's a massive permission slip for me to understand the higher attributes and lower attributes of the energy that I naturally express. And I don't have to soften those intense parts of myself. I just need to learn like with the 2145, how not to be like super controlling bossy <laughs> or, you know, try to understand that. Um, with my channel of preservation, I was constantly giving, 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 and understanding the keynotes of my specific um, gates and, uh, and my specific lines in that gate and in that channel. Um, and so for me, learning about human design, I spent about, mm, I'd say six months, really just diving into my own design and kind of doing it like we discussed in our podcast with Larry looking up, kind of learning about design through other people's designs. And uh, it took me a while to really solidify the information in my mind because I was listening to raw lectures and stuff straight from source. So it was a lot to take in for me. And once I got a hang of it, I was like, you know, I'd like to explore this more. So some of my education is I took... Um, Living Your Design with IHDS, 
And then I took the next two foundational classes, Rave ABCs and Rave Cartography with Human Design Collective, um, Amy Lee and John Cole. And from there, I didn't really didn't really do much, many other classes or anything like that. It was a lot of self-study, a lot of source material. Um, we took, Teresa and I both took uh, like holistic human design analysis with James Alexander. And I've just kind of been integrating human design into all of these other modalities and certifications that I have around healing. Um, and when I first understood human design, I wouldn't say right when I, it didn't happen right when I learned about it. It was a couple months later, I was like, aha, this is giving me the language for what I'm picking up when I interact with somebody. You know, I would kind of think that I was being judgmental or, you know, I, I guess judgy would be the best way. <laughs> it's like I could feel something almost like a static. Sometimes when people were talking or describing like parts of themselves or <clears throat> what they want to do or, I mean, anything, I would feel something that just wasn't resonant. And I'm like, who am I to judge? I have no idea. And then learning about my design, I'm like, oh my gosh, this human design is giving me the language around what I'm picking up from other people, whether it's their open centers, whether it's their motivation, I mean, various different things. And I'm feeling cognition. So we pick up vibes, right? <laughs> we pick up vibes and frequency from people and words and things. And so for me, human design has been an excellent tool in my toolbox for understanding myself and understanding other people and really just having a shitload more compassion for everybody. Yeah. yeah. I wonder too, if um, just hearing you share your story again and thinking about my own process, I can't remember where I heard this. I don't know who said this, but receptive minds need to take things in. It almost takes us longer to process things because we need to take all of it in. Like we're taking in the frequency, we're taking in all of it. And I think it can take us a while to have it fully click before we can turn around and talk about it right? It's almost like, like I'll see a left brain, left mind, learn something quickly. And I don't want to generalize this because this might not be every left brain, left mind's experience, but I've seen this before where they'll be able to like kind of quickly get the essence of something and then flip it around and show someone how to do it or teach it. My dad's left brain, left mind, and I've seen him do this a bunch of times. And for me, it almost, be, I think because we're taking so much in, we almost have to see it in life before we can understand it. So I could read about a gate in a book and be like, oh, cool. Uh, I kind of get what that means. But then I could actually see it playing out in an interaction with somebody. And that's when I'll get it. Yeah, I completely agree. My business partner is uh, quad left and she'll read a book. She's also 5'1", so she's always reading a book. But she'll read a book and then she'll be like implementing it the next day. She's a therapist. She'll be like, oh, look, I read about this tool. And she'll be like, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, what? How? Yeah. It's like yeah. if it captures their focus, because mm -hmm. obviously they're going to just be tuning into one specific thing, one focus about that. But if it captures their focus, then they can turn around and teach it and just make it make sense, you know, where yeah. I almost think receptive minds might even come off as kind of skeptical sometimes because we're mm -hmm. like, oh, mm -hmm. I just don't, I don't get it yet. Uh, and we might seem like we're doubting it because we don't get it until it's like, it's like how, how I have to do something in order to get it. Like let's mm -hmm. say I'm learning something new at work or something. I then have to do it before I can get it. I can't just watch somebody. I watch them and then I do it myself and then I'm like, cool, I got it. Kind of like playing a board game. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, 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 I eat when people tell me yeah. rules to avoid yes. it. I'm like, let's just start playing. Yeah. I'll get it. I have to watch you do it and then try it and I'll do it. Like listening yeah. to somebody go over rules of a board game is excruciatingly painful for me. Yeah. That's same. I'm like, let's just, I don't, I don't care. Let's just get started. I'll learn it as we go. That's, that's totally fine. 
Yes. Yes. 100%. Because <laughs> when I think uh, about human design, I'm like, that's very much how it's been. It's mm. with learning it, you know? And I feel like I understood the types pretty quickly because I knew people in every category in my network. When I was working at the gym, I ran people's charts pretty quickly. And then I was like, oh, I get this because I can feel that. Mm -hmm. And not that I was an expert at it, but I could, like, I'm still learning stuff about the types now, you know, it's, there's so much nuance, but I could feel it right away, you know? Yes. Yes. And I, I've mentioned this on our Instagram um, before, but I'll say it again on here. It took me like two months for my brain to wrap around what a gate and a channel was like, I, I, it wouldn't compute. Like I just had to uh, like immerse myself into it. And yeah, it was, it was a wild adventure of, of learning human design. Yep. And I should also mention, I am a six line. Um, so with my four, six profile, obviously, but I'm 37. So I am comfortably on the roof right now. <laughs> and yeah. And how long have you been in your experiment? Because that's a badge of honor in human oh, design. Oh, <laughs> so I'm in my, I've entered into my fifth year. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. So I'm just I mean, joking about it being a badge of honor, by the I'm way. I'm in the quickening, <laughs> the quickening stage. Yeah. I feel like if anything, if you know about the seven year alchemical process, which we've talked about this before on Coffee Talk, but it's Richard Rudd wrote this document that's called the seven year alchemical process. And it's just about the seven year cycle. Each year it has a different theme. It almost has its own design. Mm -hmm. So knowing where somebody is in that just kind of tells you where they're at in that cycle. It's not a, uh, what's the word? It's not like a hierarchical thing. Like, Oh, Brandy's better than somebody that's been in it mm -hmm. or five or two years or whatever. It's, it just kind of is more information. And it, I still consider Richard Rudd's document data that we're experimenting with. Like, I don't see it as truth. I see it as something for us all to experiment with and see if, if it rings true. And so far from what I can tell with the people I've chatted with, it has, but yes. Yeah. And on my chart, you will see that I am full of first lines. So I'm always digging in <laughs> which is very prevalent with the two of us because I only have one first line uh -huh, I think uh -huh. one maybe two I'm mostly second lines and fourth lines yes and I don't have any second lines um but I am hope motivation so I am here to uh call out those second lines which the having no second lines is an interesting thing so I've heard that if you don't have second lines you feel kind of opaque, like, and you and I have talked about this, where it feels mm -hmm. like people don't necessarily call you out for your gifts or they don't really see you. Does that feel true for you? Yeah. Yeah. I think that call out is very important without, I mean, not even having to have a second line in your profile, but that call out is important because, uh, it's like recognition, you know, it's like confirmation, <laughs> So I'm just kind of floating around like, well, I don't know. Nobody is saying anything. So it's, yeah, yeah. We you do dwell. get recognition, but you don't necessarily get called out. Like second lines, yeah. get, it's almost like people try to force us out. <laughs> sometimes mm. like people will be kind of aggressive with us sometimes. Mm -hmm. so, come yes. on, you, why aren't you doing this? You should really do this. That's you know, me. Even if, That's me. Yes. That's you're the I one do doing that. all the time, all the time. And then I <laughs> pull up their chart and they're a second line. And I'm like, all the time. Because <laughs> your whole I'm, motivation. I, I'm married to a two, four, uh, two of my best friends are two fours. Um, I'm surrounded by six twos and two fours and, um, an occasional five, two or two, five, but a lot of two fours and yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so for anyone who's listening, that's hope motivation that is resonating with that. Even if you do have second lines in your chart and you have hope motivation, you might be somebody that feels like you're always calling people out, trying to get them to see their gifts, trying to get them to see their brilliance, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I just uh, happen to have my personality sending gate 39.4, which is temperance, which is provocation at the correct time. And so my call outs aren't always 
um, you know, soft. <laughs> I'll say. Like, get over here. <laughs> what are you doing? I don't know why I turned you into a cowboy, but <laughs> it's all good. Um, so with my with my split, my bridging gates are seven, forty-four, and twenty. And um as a split definition, what I notice is that I need to, and I'm a fourth line, but I need to externalize a lot and process with other people. It could be the most random things. And when my split is bridged, it feels so nice. And if there was one gate in the entire chart that I wish that I had, it would be gate 16. Mm, skills. Yes. Yeah. No, that that's a bridging gate too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Left that and one out. why is that? Why, why would you like that gate? Um, because that 48, the well, I, uh, and it makes me question like not having the consistent access to the skills. I'm like, I have all this information and I have all of this knowledge and I feel like there's not a lot of ways for me to apply it mm. or that I can't apply it. Or I'm, I don't want to say not good enough because that's not the right word. I don't know what the word would be. Because I, I definitely don't have a problem with confidence, but it's just like, like sometimes doubting. there's a part, there's a part of me that's like somebody else is better at applying those skills of the knowledge, you know? Which also might go into you being hope motivation. You're so used to calling people out and also a defined ego, supporting people, pumping people up yeah. that it's almost like you can't do that for yourself, but you can do it for others. And you're so used to doing it for others that that feels more natural for you. Yeah. Cause I've def I've built a business around that calling yeah. people out. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Things are making more sense now. Yeah. <laughs> We your learned something your dilemma, right? We learned something new all the time about yeah. ourselves. <laughs> we really do. This is the constant evolution. Uh huh. Yeah. Because sometimes it's like you can logically get it, and I don't know if this is a fourth line thing. Or I don't know, but I could look at something in my design and I could logically understand it, mm -hmm. and then I'll start talking to somebody about it, and I'm like, oh, ho holy shit! Wait a minute, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And that gate 48 is unconscious for you. I know. Yeah. Yep. I guess I never fully realized that your 5027 is unconscious. I mean, half conscious, but right. that also makes a lot more sense too, because that is so strong in you. And I mm -hmm. feel like your mind questions it sometimes. All like, the time. What am I doing? <laughs> All the time. Like how you'll just have so much energy to care when somebody is in extreme need of it. Right. And how I'm like, I don't understand what, how I can care right now. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. One hundred percent. And right now I have a long-term transit because I have gate three twice and we have gate 60 for another year. So I'm yep. learning about that. Yeah. Do you want to pull up your chart? Yeah. Now I feel naked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel like I'm on the chopping block now. <laughs> <laughs> so for those listening that can't see on YouTube, I'm a 2-4 emotional manifesting generator. I have seven channel, no, six channels, seven defined centers, 1156, 1020, 1222, 3955, 659, and 2838. I have 2838 and 1020 and 1156 conscious. My 659 is fully unconscious. And then my 1222 and 3955 are half unconscious. Uh, as far as my advanced variable stuff, I am nervous determination, feeling cognition, shores artificial. I also have feeling tone in my environment, um, personal view and desire motivation and then same variables as brandy right brain right mind right environment and uh, left 
strategic view. So as far as my human design education, when I first found human design, it was through Jenna Zoe on a podcast and I bought a bunch of stuff from her and ordered Shay Tom Parkins book. I ordered, I did not order the definitive book for a while, but I ordered uh, Karen Curry Parker's book. I bought a few lectures from Ra and he sounded like he was speaking a different language. I just could not take Ra in when I first found human design. So very different than Brandy's experience. It took me, I would say about six months to a year to be able to listen to a raw lecture and actually take him in. But for whatever reason, I just needed the softer, um, I guess, for lack of a better way to say it, like a more feminine approach and the more, I don't know, just the way, the way that was easier for my mind to understand at that time. And I feel like if I would have jumped into foundation classes and raw at that time, I probably would not have liked human design. I probably would have steered away from it. So I'm actually grateful for the poppers out there, <laughs> pop human design folks that introduce the system to me in a soft way. You know, obviously we've already talking about talked about this a lot on our previous episode, so I don't want to get too much into that, but there were obviously things that lacked depth. And by the time I was ready to take foundation courses, it was a lot easier for me. So that being said, I self-studied pretty much for three years, two years before I took my first foundation course. Uh, I kind of dabbled in all of them. I took one with IHGS, one with Human Design America, and then one with Human Design Collective, and then did uh, Brandy and I both did a practicum with Human Design Collective after our rave cartography because our class loved Amy and John so much that we were all begging them to teach us how to be analysts. <laughs> and they are not qualified through IHDS to teach analyst training, so we, they came up with the practicum idea, and it was amazing. And we did that for a few months, and we would just look at charts in class. We could bring whatever charts we wanted. And it was great. And then took James Alexander's uh, analyst training. What am I missing? I guess that's pretty much it. I've Other than that, I've just listened to tons of raw audio and all kinds of stuff. And I feel like for me, the learning really happened when Brandy and I became friends. And I had somebody to talk to about this every day, all day. Because before that, I felt like I was on my own. I didn't really know anybody that was involved in the experiment. As a fourth line, I was telling everybody in my network and trying to get people excited about it. And it was working a bit. I had a few people that were interested that, you know, got excited about it, that wanted to learn, but nobody that was taking it as seriously as me that I could actually really nerd out with around it. So becoming friends with Brandy, I feel like just, and I feel like our initial conversation was, do you want to be study buddies? <laughs> Cause we were both looking for that. So yes, yes. it was kind of funny. I think we did one session where we were like, let's study. And then we just talked the whole time. <laughs> yeah. We didn't know like our, we were still living in like the strategic mind land where we're like, <laughs> let's study. And then we realized, no, all we actually had to do is talk to each other every day. And that's how we study. That's really it. Yeah. yeah, if you're a receptive mind and you're forcing yourself to read chapter after chapter, and not that receptive minds can't study, like we definitely can, especially when we're interested in something, but I think the way that we do it is very different. Like I don't just go in a linear fashion. I, and not that all strategic minds do that. I'm sure strategic minds just kind of zero in on something that's interesting to them. Um, but I find that it has to kind of be alive for me in my life. And I have to be able to relate it to something or someone and almost attach a story to it. Yes. Yeah. And Teresa and I actually became friends. We met in Sam Zagard's, um, what was, what Stra class? it was a strategy, strategy and, authority and authority class. class. That's right. And then that's where we met each other. And then in the chat of that class, it was like, drop your IG handle. So everybody did. And so I was following Teresa on Instagram and she was following me, blah, blah, blah. And she made a post about offering receptivity sessions, just like pull from her receptivity. And I was like, that's fucking genius. And I reached out to her and was like, that's the biggest permission slip ever. That's fucking amazing. And that night uh, 
we were just talking back and forth, but voice noting on, on Instagram and Teresa was in Mexico on vacation and I was at home and I looked at my husband. I was like, I just met my new best friend. I, I can feel it. Like it was the probability just the, is high. Probability is high. And it was totally like that stepbrother moment where they're like, do we just become best friends? Exactly. And, and we did. And it was so wild because as we were like pulling from each other, it was like these, no way. And you're experiencing this and you're going through this. And because Teresa and I have heavy backgrounds in like spirit, ultra spirituality. <laughs> and we were kind of, we were coming out of that and seeing that there was a new way or different, you know, like some of that just wasn't vibing with us. And we were able to talk to each other about it right away. And it was like, wow. And that was so freeing because yeah. I remember I was going through, I don't know, mutation at that point or something where I was just realizing that the whole ultra spiritual vibe was not my vibe and that human design pulled me out of that, of almost being very ungrounded. And it just human design pulled me back into my body mm -hmm. and to be able to talk to somebody else that was going through that exact same thing in that moment was so helpful. And then I remember we also bonded over feeling cognition because I don't feel like I really understood feeling cognition until we talked about it. Again, it was just this concept and then actually having real life tangible things to talk to somebody else who's had the exact same experience down to the whole like we can't watch a movie where there's violence because it literally hurts our whole bodies or... Yes. You know, we're sensitive to certain things like technology and Wi-Fi and things like that. And to just be able to relate to somebody right away with that was yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And we could just, uh, I think this is maybe where we just vibe into, I'm, I have gate 39, Teresa has 3955. We both have a lot of definition, a lot of intensity, and we could just like meet each other there you know, where it felt safe to be ourselves, to like provoke and not take it. I don't know. We could just be ourselves immediately. We don't get some... defensive. Yes. You and I yeah. poke each other all the time and all the time. we've never been in an argument over like one of us being too, like, I don't want to say too sensitive, but defensive because you poked something where I think we're both used to being met with that when perhaps and we both have temperance we both have 39.4 but I do think there's a little bit of a learning curve with with that for me especially because I'm emotional I sometimes used to poke people at the wrong time right mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I'd get a really bad reaction or sometimes it would be the right time I'd just get a bad reaction in the moment and then later they'd come back and be like, I'm really glad you said that to me. Like it triggered me in the moment or upset me in the moment, but I'm glad you said that to me. And to have a friend that I can just do that with. Right. <laughs> it's like we're sword fighting all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so and we don't even realize that we're doing it because we were chatting on the phone yesterday and then she texts me like an hour later and is like, my mind's still reeling over when you 39'd me. And I was like, <laughs> well, I didn't even know I did that. <laughs> I'm like, oh, straight to the heart. <laughs> I didn't even realize it. Oh, also, I don't think uh, um, she's personality son 12.2 and she is cross with the Maya. No, Eden. Jesus. <laughs> My mom's across with the Maya, though. That's We were just talking about that yesterday, yeah. too. So, yeah. Just yeah. in there in the receptivity. <laughs> and she has a completely open head and completely open with nothing pointing to the head and completely open ego center. Yep. Yeah, I have three gates pointing at my ego center. If you're on YouTube, you can see this. I have 45, 37, and 44. So 26, 44 is an electromagnetic for Brandy and I. And then uh, 2034 also. And that was funny when we realized that because I don't think we really realized what that meant for our connection because we <laughs> started up this project together really quickly, not looking at it as a business, you know, but the 2644 is a very entrepreneurial channel, but we did start like teaching group courses together and we did start up a business doing that. And then I come up to Iowa pretty often and work for Brandy and work out of her space. And 
we just naturally collaborate in business and it was so easy. It wasn't just like, it just fell into place that way. Uh And then also we did notice that whenever we're in person together, we're so busy. We're just doing shit all the time and we don't even take pictures of each other Uh or hanging out or together Uh or whatever. And we don't even really go on our phones much because Uh -uh. we're so busy. (laughs) So now we make a conscious effort, like, let's take a picture together. (laughs) Because we have 34, 20. And it took us like a year and a half for us to realize like, (gasps) oh, shit, we have 34. We were so busy. We didn't even realize it. Yeah. And so now when we like travel together, because our husbands are friends also, which is like divine, um, we're like, hey, will you take pictures of us sometimes, like randomly? Because we will mind us. <laughs> I noticed it too when I'd come see you when it was cold out. We were better about it or we didn't seem as busy. So I don't think we noticed it. But mm-hmm. then it was like when I came in the springtime and it was nice out, we were just running errands and doing shit all day long. And it's just like, what did we even do today? I don't know. <laughs> no idea. We're just going. Yep. We're just going. It's great. And we we bond over channel of struggle. We bond over our fear of death. <laughs> it being all we think about. All, all we think time. about. <laughs> I was telling Brandy yesterday, I'm like, oh, I, I was looking at my Uranus opposition chart, which isn't for a while, but, you know, open head. I was curious. And it's cross of the unexpected. And immediately my mind went to, am I going to die? Is somebody I love going to die? Who's going to die unexpectedly? <laughs> like, what the hell? Just on the brain all the time. All the freaking time. All the time. And we, uh, together, we complete the defense circuit. So that's cool. When we're around, you're really taken care of. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm like, what do you need to talk about? Do and I'm like, are you hungry? Yeah. You- <laughs> I'm like, do you need to bare your soul to me? And you're like, let me massage your feet. <laughs> let me massage your feet and feed you. And what do you, oh, you don't feel well here. Some light therapy need? on you. <laughs> All of it. <laughs> yep. Everything. This is why we joke about having a compound together because- we got that yeah. defense, baby. <laughs> yeah, we're building the compound. And I have the one emotional gate. I have gate 49. So when we're together, Teresa has like, she already has a lit emotional center with everything except for 49. If you're just listening to this on Spotify. And most of her, majority of her solar plexus is unconscious. Mm-hmm. Her only conscious gate is gate 30. Which I get that question a lot. How did I learn about my emotional authority when it's mostly unconscious? I don't know. <laughs> I Waiting, waiting for clarity and also talking to people with fully conscious emotional channels that have words for it. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, that, that is what I experience. It, I get a lot more depth from people that have fully conscious emotional channels. And I feel like for me, waiting with, is almost... I don't want to say more important, but because I'm not necessarily aware that the process is going on and it it takes me longer to realize I'm in a wave, you know, it'll be like, oh, I'm in a low because I realized of how I said something or the sound of my voice or how I talk to somebody or the thoughts that I'm having, but it isn't an immediate thing that I notice. And I don't know if that's the case for fully conscious or not, but when I first heard that I was emotional authority, I well first of all I was listening to a podcast that they were talking about all the different authorities and I was like I have to be the emotional one because anytime I make a decision too quickly it doesn't turn out well and it was the kind of thing that I knew immediately it was me and at the same time I was not happy about it and I was confused by it too I was like I know this is me but I also don't get it (laughs) so not not for authority but for type when I first saw my design I was like and understood the difference between a manifester and a manifesting generator. I was like, I operate as a manifester <laughs> before I understood what split single, all of that was I'm like, I think it's wrong. I think I'm a manifester. That was definitely plowing through the world as an ego manifester. Mm-hmm. Well, I remember I, I listened to all the types first and all the authorities. And then I looked up my chart and I thought I was a manifester upon listening to everything 
just mm-hmm. from where my life was in that moment and how things were going, I was like, oh, I'm definitely a manifester. Yeah. And then I saw manifesting generated. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Why am I half right? <laughs> yeah. What does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> what and is then, this? Coming from our like ultra spiritual backgrounds, it's like, no, I want to manifest. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I want to be a manifester because a manifest shit. Can we talk about that? Because I see I see that all the time. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a super valid thing to wonder and to talk about with how the spiritual space is. And a lot of people find human design from that space. And that's all you hear about in the spiritual space is manifesting your life and blah, 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 blah. And what, so what do you see the difference? I know my definition or human design's definition. How do you see this playing out? human design's definition of manifesting as in the manifester type, the doer and quote unquote manifesting your life. Well, they have the, this is, (laughs) this might piss some people off. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The manifestation community you're creating what you want with your mind. In human design, our mind doesn't get to pick. It's not the creator. Do I think that there are parts of people's charts that aren't manifestors that can lend to it being easier to quote unquote manifest or to bring something into your reality that you want yes fourth line feeling cognition (laughs) i was the world's greatest manifester in the words and like the spiritual term of manifester i could bring anything i could just say and it would come to me you know and it wasn't because it's because i could feel something that was resonant with me and then i would externalize it to my network And my network would be like, here you go. I mean, every, this is people like used to ask me to teach about manifestation because they would just watch me and see how, oh my gosh, like one time I wasn't feeling well and I got on Facebook back when, before Instagram was a thing. And I put on Facebook that I really wanted a Coke in a can and like 20 minutes later, I used to smoke cigarettes. I went outside to smoke a cigarette and there was a Coke in a can on my front step. Manifested it. (laughs) You know, (laughs) somebody, I don't know who it was. They didn't ever say somebody put a Coke in a can on my front step. Um, I think that manifestation culture, as far as like calling in things that you want could be detrimental to what is your traje- to your trajectory to what you're de- like designed to interact with um how are you feeling about what i'm saying yeah i for me before i found human design what do you think i wanted yeah money <laughs> money, money, money. <laughs> yeah i wanted yeah. all the money that's where all of my quote unquote manifestation efforts were going And I think as a fourth line, and I've heard other people say this too, because what we externalize can become a reality. Mm -hmm. We think that we're quote unquote manifesting something with our mind when it's really that we've created a network and we're externalizing to our network. Yep. And I remember I was taking, it was like when I first found human design, I was taking this manifestation course and they had you, you know, list out you had to choose like one manifestation that you wanted that was something that was believable that you could achieve. Because remember, the whole thing was you have to believe that you can do it. And so I chose something that wasn't that crazy. I think I was like, I want to manifest $3,500 because I wanted to take this course that cost that much. It, I was doing stretch therapy at the time and it was like the next level of stretch therapy. And I also needed money for taking the week off work and all this stuff. So I, at the time, was working in a gym, pretty well connected. I had a good network. I knew some well-to-do people. Some of my clients were pretty well off. And 
I have put this down on my list and I'm doing the visualization techniques and all the things. And maybe five days later, one of my clients who I was already working with, he's, he just never decided to do this before. He was like, you know, I'm just going to pay for a year in advance. And it was the exact amount, like after taxes is the exact amount that I needed. And at that moment, I was convinced. I was like, manifestation is real. But now I see, you know what? That wasn't that odd for that to happen. I already had this relationship with this person. I've been working with them for a year. He had a lot of money. It wasn't a big deal for him to pay for a year. And the timing of it was as such where that was my trajectory. So life lined up for that to be able to happen for me. That's the way I look at it. it I had a response to the training. I just didn't have the resources for it. But I had opportunities that I'd created it within the network that lined up for mm -hmm. me to have that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't tell somebody you can have that too, just because that happened to me. I don't know if that's correct for somebody else. Right. And I don't think, I think at the time I was, you know, whether we are aware of our strategy and authority, it's always happening. And just because we're not fully conscious of it, there's still times that we make correct decisions before yeah. we found design, you know, yeah. of course yeah. there is. And to me, and, and I should say, I, I know some people don't like the word correct because it feels like the, the other one is incorrect. And I truly don't think there's like an incorrect decision. I think there's a decision that can create discomfort sometimes or where you have to learn more about yourself and your process. But the way I see a correct decision is when I'm hitting green lights and things just are falling into place and working out for me. Mm -hmm. And I had already made the decision I wanted to do this training. I was just waiting for the resources to come in. Mm -hmm. And I was unattached, honestly, to the timing. The timing even worked out because we were moving fitness studios, we were moving gyms. And normally I wouldn't have been able to have a whole week off work. The week that we were moving gyms was the week the training happened. So we didn't have a place to work anyways. Cause it was just me and my business partner. We had, we had really small staff. I wouldn't have been able to take time off work. So it was just wild how it all worked out. The timing all worked out, but I was really tuned into my body without even knowing that for it to work out. And then at that training is where I met somebody who ended up being like a future mentor and like a good friend. And it's just really interesting thinking about all the timing and how, how life lifed for me. Yeah. <laughs> and know? that's and so, what, yeah, I, I can look back to multiple things where, um, it could appear as like a manifestation. And it's like, no, I was just responding to something and life lined up. Yeah. Things. And, you know, um, a lot of my stuff would show materially, but I have the design of a materialist with a 2145. So it very much appears in my life that I can make magic manifestation with money. <laughs> When it's really and you moving numbers around and when it's really it's just like moving shit around and you know or I say yes to something and I'm it's I'm supported it's my natural trajectory for that to happen um having the money line doesn't mean you always have money for me it just means that my mind will freak out about money all the time but I Looking back, I've really never had to worry about money, like ever. Even when I was single mom, living in a duplex with Weston, my rent was $600 a month. I worked at the salon uh, one to two nights a week and every other Saturday because I wanted to kind of be a stay-at-home mom, <laughs> stay-at-home single mom as much as I could. Even when that was my life. And I had to thrift everything and I was on food stamps. I was always, I always had enough. For me, I think the money line is just, we have what we need when we need it. Mm -hmm. And our mind's going to trip out thinking we need more or it's not going to come or, you know, there's always something, but that's my experience with, with that channel. Yeah. And my parents have that as an electromagnetic and then Thomas, my husband has it. And I find that even though I would say my mom was more um, concerned about money, she's the 21. And that's kind of where I got some of my money mentality around was like wanting to kind of hoard money, being afraid to spend it, afraid to use it, wanting to control it. But 
being in a relationship with somebody who has a full channel and he's just so chill about money. He's like, I don't know. Money's always coming in and going out. It's he just understands kind of the energetics of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and is fine releasing it. And yep. I'm like, uh, I don't know if I should spend, you know, <laughs> and I get really nervous about it. Um, but I also have been in that place where I've had like zero dollars in my bank account and mm -hmm. I don't ever want to be there again. I remember in college I had no money and I and I'm I'm privileged in that my parents paid for my rent when I was in college. So I wasn't going to lose my place, but I had no money for groceries and no money for they didn't pay for my utilities or anything like that. Like they just paid my rent, which I, I realize is a huge privilege, but I also had to pay for everything else and I was in school. So I got a tax uh, a tax refund for like $1,000. I remember I promised to myself <laughs> from my open ego, I would never let myself have less than $1,000 in my bank account. And from that point on, I I just always did it, but it almost made me really concerned because then it, my mind created this artificial threshold of like, you need $1,000 to feel safe, you know? So that's just interesting how our minds will create that type of thing of like, you're not safe if you don't have this amount of money. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, also let money be free, like Thomas, and have that, like, it'll come back and it's fine. And yeah, I have a partner who doesn't have the money line and, and is like, at first he was like, what the fuck are we doing? What are you doing? You know, <laughs> like it needs to breathe. <laughs> let it go. It'll come back. And uh, yeah, I very much, very much believe that same thing. Mm-hmm. Cause it it's always it, that's how it's always been for me, even if I've had no money in my bank account, um, or lots of money in my bank account, and and I have that twenty seven fifty, and I believe that forty five twenty one. Also, like I like to provide for other people. So if you're in, in if you're in my tribe, and I'm doing well, you're taken care of. You know, I often, as soon as, <laughs> like, we're about to sell our house or it's, it's about to sell and we're buying some land and I'm like, oh, then we can take some of that money and buy some other houses or we can trees that we can buy trees in Thomas's house and we can, you know, <laughs> just like, how can we provide for other people with that as well? You know, what blows my mind about the money line is how generous you can be with other people. But then in your own life, you could be so cheap about something. And it'll so take, cheap. It'll take me off guard with Thomas where like he'll spend like, you know, hundreds of dollars on something that is like for our family or like whatever. And then it could be like uh, something like where he's saving two dollars. He's like, oh, I could do this because I'll save two dollars <laughs> <Yeah>. or whatever. <laughs> what it's like he'll have no problem spending a chunk of money and then when it comes to like two dollars yeah he's cheap about yeah it. that's the the I call it the ice cream scoop story because <clears throat> we didn't have an ice cream scoop for like the first seven years of our relationship ship slash marriage and Andy kept being like let's just buy it and I'm like no it's it doesn't it's not a good use of money <laughs> And mind you, I have no problem being like, uh, I need a brand new car because I don't want to deal with anything breaking in the car. You know, it's worth it to make sure we have vehicles that are, t you know, and that our kids have really good shoes and, you know, all of that shit. But an ice cream scoop that costs $5 doesn't, isn't to get use of money. And we finally bought an ice cream scoop and it was like amazing. Like, oh my God, this is what we've been missing out on. <laughs> the smooth scooping of ice cream, but it took forever to just buy an ice cream scoop. Or I'll be like, we'll be at the store and Weston will pick up a box of something and I'll be like, oh, we can make that at home. And he's like, we can, can we really mom? Or, and he'll, he'll joke back at me sometimes and he'll pick up some random thing that he knows I can't make like a material object. And he'll be like, oh, mom, do you like this? And I'm like, yeah. And he'll be like, too bad. You'll have to make it at home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so cheap. I'm so cheap, but I'm also the type of person that goes out to eat and I leave a hundred, hundred fifty dollar tip. That's what would blow my mind about you, because you'd be like, "Oh no, I don't. I'm gonna save money and like not 
buy this shirt for myself or whatever and then go spend a hundred dollars to tip somebody so yeah. it's it's like this weird spectrum yeah yeah because I because because then it's like sending it out there to like you said it's energy right mm -hmm. like sending it out there to go do some stuff which to me I get that too because if you go just buy yourself the shirt from Target or whatever, that's giving money to a big corporation, which we all do it. It's not, yeah. I mean, not all of us. I'm sure there's people that don't, but that's something that's kind of just a part of being an American considering you can't really get by easily without giving money to big corporations. But it just, to me, it would like feel better in my soul to be like, I'm giving this money to another human that took care of me versus to buy myself this thing that I may or may not really need. Yeah. And I'm not like, I want to just throw this in there. I'm not like driven by making money because to be honest, I don't take a paycheck home from my business right now. Ooh. Ooh. Getting real honest here. Yeah. I don't take a paycheck. Could Paycheck's I? Yes, I could. Yes. But... I say that's relatively normal for people like in startup situations. Yeah. I mean, we're four years in. Uh, I don't count the first like three because of COVID. So I call this year technically year one. Yeah. Um, But I like it fills my heart and soul and makes me feel alive to be able to grow and build and pay my employees more and do bonuses and because they're the ones that are helping me build. And I, satisfaction is my currency. You're and I am, care of. right. And I'm privileged enough to have a husband that has an income. Yeah. You know, um, but I wouldn't put my, I wouldn't put it past myself to do the same thing. Um, even if I, he wasn't around. I you feel know. like you'd be like still hustling with hair. Like I do. I would. Or I would and, like, like something to, like, yeah, to like, all we need is food and a roof over our head. Like, and I need a car that's not going to break down. That's it. And other than that, like I would still. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I definitely see that like with my parents too. Um, my parents have, they're both. 37 40s they have the 21 45 together and the 50 27 together and they've always lived very well below their means I want to say when I was growing up we were paycheck to paycheck but once my brother and I got to college and they didn't and him and I got jobs and stuff they didn't have as much to pay for obviously and they my mom drove the same old van for she drove that thing into the ground like she drove that thing for probably 27 28 years um they just got a new car probably in 2018 or 2019 for the first time my dad would just kind of buy used beat up cars and if you go to their house it's kind of like 90s <laughs> blast from the past like they don't spend money updating their house and they've done a few things like painting and getting tile and stuff but I grew up in a very frugal household, but then they would spend money on like my college education or, you know, any time when I was younger that I wanted to do something that would further my education that I needed my, like they paid for the personal training school that I went to because it was an in-person school and it was not affordable for me at that time. And they just knew that that would further my education, but then they wouldn't spend money on frivolous things. So I think I grew up just being aware of the value of a dollar. And then I had to go through my own trial and error experience of that in my 20s once I was making my own money and had to learn. I think it was almost like because I grew up in such a frugal household, when I finally had my own money, I was like, I can buy whatever I want. I can go buy new shoes today, you know, because it was that kind of household where if you didn't need new shoes, like they weren't falling apart, you weren't getting them. And now I'm like, well, I can just buy them because I want them. And sometimes I feel like I do it as an act of rebellion. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I don't have to be frugal if I don't want to. Or I can buy a new car if, just if I want to. Not really, but I, yeah. I did do that in 2019. Um, so, yeah, money is, a, is an interesting thing once you realize, number one, your design is a factor. Number two, the conditioning you grew up in. Yep. Uh, for sure. So Yeah. 
And I can totally see my open ego son doing that same thing when he has his own. Oh, he already does it with his own money. But um, when he moves out, it'll be like a whole new world. Because he doesn't understand. He's like, you guys have money. Why are we not using it all? All Mm -hmm. the time, (laughs) you know? And he was very confused when we moved into a trailer recently. And it's like, but our neighborhood we lived in and like, you know, this big, beautiful house. And for me, it's like moving from like what I value is changing it's always been inside, but now I have the ability to like make the moves to like support what I value. And that's, I want to be close with my tribe. I want to be more self-sufficient in things. And I just want to feel, I want to just take care of people, take care of my house, take care of myself, you know, and it doesn't have to, I don't want to be spending all of our money on a house. I want to spend it on, I want a cow and some goats and (laughs) <laughs> you know, stuff like that. And I love, don't get me wrong, we take big vacations because I'm bougie still, you know. So we take like two week vacations to islands and shit. Um, and then we'll come back home to our trailer. Yep. And I feel like sometimes, and I know you, you and I have talked about this, but you just are kind of going through the motions and you end up having all this stuff or being in this situation that creates a lifestyle that you have to work really hard to stay up with. You know, it's like, okay, I have this big house now because I thought that's just what you do, but I'm also spending a ton of money every month on this and we have to keep making this amount of money in order to keep up with this lifestyle. Yeah. Well, and and, yeah, it just doesn't, is that what I want to be doing with my time? We have a finite amount of time in these bodies. Right. Is that what I want? Do I want to be wiping 3,500 square feet of baseboards on my free time? I know. I I know I've talked about this with Michael Steinbeck Lipman. He did a tweet about this and then him and I had a whole conversation around it, but that deconditioning his tweet was something along the lines of deconditioning is really just helping people break free from capitalism Mm -hmm. and not that we can break free from it because we live in a capitalistic society like we have to do it to an extent but just helping you kind of turn it upside down and realize that you it's not sustainable to sacrifice your body for money Mm -mm. And so if you have to change your lifestyle and live in a way that's different than you're used to, than you're used to because you don't want to keep doing that same hustle or grind or whatever that you had to do before. Yeah. Like if your body is all of a sudden a no Mm -hmm. to a job, Mm -hmm. what are you going to do? You know, and I get it. Not everybody can just like quit their job or whatever because their body's a no. But I've I've had plenty of friends in this process that are literally like, I I might get evicted. I don't know where my money's going to come from because I'm a no to this job, mm-hmm. and they're waiting for something else to come along. So it does get really real. These are the parts of the deconditioning process that get really real. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I mean, you can find that in in your living situation, in your job, in your partnership, relationship. Yeah. What if your partner pays a lot of the bills and you're all of a sudden a no to being in that partnership? Yep. Or what if your partner who pays all the bills is all of a sudden a no to their job? Right. Yep. It's just, uh, hard this is, this is <laughs> shit that's hard <laughs> it is it is or like with me a lot of it is just confronting truth in myself you know because I feel like I was holding up this facade that I didn't even realize and then d- deconditioning more in my solar plexus I'm like oh my gosh I gotta meet these truths I have to confront these truths in myself not just out there you know 
Mm-hmm. It's within myself. And so I was like, no, I don't want to do this just because we can. I don't want to do that. Right. I want to live on the land and have a tribe. <laughs> Yeah. And I feel, I feel like the value of money is something I'm always going to be learning about, but even within the last year, I I tend to do things in phases. In the last year I started tracking my spending. I didn't Mm -hmm. really change any of my spending habits. I just tracked it so that I could be aware of what I was spending. And now I'm like looking at my future and thinking I'm a Capricorn rising too. So this is par for the course, but I'm looking at my future and I'm like, okay, if I just stop spending money on this and this, I can put that money into my IRA or I can buy crypto with that money or whatever. And I feel like I'm seeing how I can move things around, you know, what you desire for your money long-term. Yeah. And I also do have a 45. Yeah. Yeah. So there's that piece of it so it's like the 21 is a learning curve Mm. for me because I have to learn how to control my money and what to do with those resources I don't naturally have that definition it's it's wisdom that I have to accrue so that's what I mean by like I'll feel like I'll always be learning about it and I don't even always have the expendable income to toss in my savings you know there are months that I really am just making exactly the amount I need to live um, but when I do have that money in my saving or that money available to toss into my savings, like how can I be smart about it? You know? Yeah. And I, uh, I'm on a, a different spectrum with that. <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> I, <laughs> I believe it should breathe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, I get all like cluster fucked in the head when, like the topic of like savings, like, like I'm like, we're putting money every month away, and for why? Like, <laughs> it's invested. Just, it's not no, just like... yes. No, I know. I've <laughs> I have invested. I've made some also some good investment choices, but because of my lived experience with inter with interacting with money, I literally always have what I need when I need it, and I'm not saying that from any spiritual spirituality, whatever. It's just like always been my reality. And Brandy and, did not grow up with money, by the way. No, no, no. We like, were so poor. We were eating bologna every day. Yeah. Bologna and- <laughs> <laughs> like we were so, we uh, lived in when my parents split because my dad was an addict and got evicted. Um, and my mom moved from Colorado and we lived in, with my grandmother in a, one bed or two bedroom apartment we me and my mom who was pregnant with my sister lived in one bedroom then we moved into our own apartment and my mom was working full time and going to school full time and we were poor triscuits and baloney that was that was my life we always had what we needed though mm-hmm. so i never had like a, a scarcity thing I mean, there are things that I wanted, you know, I wanted Abercrombie and Fitch clothes. I wanted things, but I always had what we needed. And that's yeah. always been the case. Like if I needed new tires, I would, it would just happen to be around the time I get a tax return. So it's just like, oh, is this ebb and flow? I'm not telling anybody to not save any money or put any money in a savings account. It's just for you. Just This, <laughs> this is, is just my, like. <laughs> my experience of money. So Mm -hmm. because, you know, I grew up watching my parents be good savers or good, quote unquote, good savers, whatever. Mm -hmm. And but it was I think it was also from this place of for a long time, my dad was only one bringing in money. My mom stayed at home with us and we didn't have a lot of extra. And I think my dad is of the generation. He's also an immigrant. My dad is from Cuba and immigrated here when he was a teenager and Cubans are notoriously very, very hard workers, like workaholics. All of his siblings are workaholics. And I think when I see him, there's almost this feeling that it could go away overnight or something. Like, And so he's just always prepared for the worst. And I think that is growing up in Cuba that prepared him for that. That's just my assessment. But also... I see how it's paid off for them and my parents were very frugal and 
he's able to retire and because they invested properly because social security, I don't even know if our generation is going to get it. My parents mm -hmm. get a little bit, but not enough to pay for even maybe enough to pay for like their mortgage and groceries, but like, who knows what where the government's going to be at when we're old and they're mostly living off of their investments. So I see that and I'm like, oh, well, you have to do that. <laughs> Again, yeah. this is just my mind. This right. is my conditioning that says, well, you have to do that. And that's just being smart with money or else you're going to be working until you die. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I don't know. That might be the case for me anyways. I don't know <laughs> how life is going to turn out. That's the thing is like my mind's like, we have to plan. And I'm like, I don't even know if money is going to be a thing. Are right. we just going to be trading pebbles? <laughs> right, right. Seeds, trading seeds. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. So it's kind of funny thinking about it, but I've got whatever. seeds. I've got more seeds than per seed than dollars in a savings account. <laughs> yeah who knows what's gonna because here's the thing money is valuable because we give it value uh-huh what if all of a sudden water is the most valuable resource and you have to trade water or something i don't want to wish that upon any of us but i have tons of water too i have tons of water <laughs> same with my mom she got water blocks for days crossing I'm the not, maya i'm not a pr intentional prepper i just have a bunch of water because well, you're 5027 is unconscious <laughs> and I'm cold thirst so I need lots of water all the time this is why you're not an <laughs> intentional prepper <laughs> I'm an unconscious prepper mm -hmm. <laughs> um, speaking of money I think this is a great segue into the conversation around ethics oh yeah Yes. So Brittany and I had, were having a phone conversation the other day and we, we can close charts too. Oh yeah, we can do that. We were having a phone conversation the other day and we kind of came up with this idea. There's this cult podcast that we listen to, or I listen to it called a little bit culty and they do this segment called what chaps my ass mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> about cults and stuff like that. And I'm like, we could have a, what chaps my ass about human design. <laughs> yeah. And we kind of, we were kind of riffing and just seeing you know, so if there's some, if you're listening to this and there's something that chaps your ass, you can always DM us on Instagram at Human Design Coffee Talk and let us know, and maybe we can talk about it in a podcast coming up. Um, but I was on TikTok the other day, and I saw this woman doing human design readings in Jean Keys, and she was charging fifty dollars for five minutes for a human design reading. And I could not believe my eyes. <laughs> I, and the information that was being given in those five minutes to a generator, you're just supposed to follow what lights you up and you have a direct connection to your love and direction center. I mean, it was the most basic information and I, I felt like this person was ripping people off. Mm -hmm. It's unacceptable. In my, that's my perspective. Is that was absolutely outrageous. They're taking advantage of somebody for $50 to read the fluffiest, most... I, w I want to say from my source junkie heart, inaccurate information, or it could have been said better, probably described their differentiation. I mean, if you were a generator watching this TikTok live, you would have got the same, you would, could have gotten yourself a free reading about being a generator while well, somebody paid $50 for it. Mm. So what chaps your ass is the value is not there because the rage inside of me when I saw that. <laughs> because let's be honest, if like somebody who, like let's say James Alexander, because I know he can just into a chart yep. and just give you 
boom, 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 boom. He's somebody I would pay $50 for five minutes to just boom into like, he yeah, just shatter you in five minutes. Like the, if it was that kind of nuanced, yes. deep information. And as somebody who does readings on TikTok live, I, I'm not trying to play devil's advocate here, but I do want to say it's not the best medium to deliver this system. Um, I do struggle with that. So I think why I'm not drawn to do that. If some of you have found me on TikTok and you're here, that's why I don't do it a whole lot because you end up like, let's say you do have a brand new person. I want to tell them about their nuanced differentiation. I want to tell them about their channels, but you have to tell them about the basics. And I feel like after doing it for so long, I kind of found a way to do that, to just give them a little bit about the basics and then also give them some really helpful things. And when you understand a chart in depth and you understand, you know, um, the not self and w when you're looking for certain markers in the chart, you can give a very effective, like short thing to somebody to just help them have an aha moment or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. I think what you're probably feeling from this person is that maybe they don't have that deep understanding of the chart. So they're not able to like kind of quickly see some things and be like, oh, this is your Venus placement or this is your Mars placement. And so this might be something you struggle with or this, you know, because that kind of and, stuff I think could be really impactful, right? And even if they, even if she does have that knowledge and she's like, I don't want to speak for her, <clears throat> but if she's like, maybe there people aren't ready for it, don't charge $50. Yeah. Like if you want a awesome TikTok reading, go find Brandy Yates, her actual page. Cause there's like posers Bakers. on TikTok. Yeah. She's incredible <laughs> at just hammering in there, getting in there. She does not charge $50. She'll pop up on TikTok and just like laser focus her projector. She's a three, five channel of struggle projector just gets in there, you know? Um, my but problem I, with doing them is I'd go over, I'd be like, okay, right. it's going to be 10 minutes. And then it'd be like 20 <laughs> minutes later and I have people waiting and I'm like, I can't stop. <laughs> but there's just like enough of this charging. I mean, it's just outrageous. I, and I understand why IHDS has their analysts. They have to like cap their reading costs and they have this standard across the board. So people aren't ripping people off. And I'm gonna say it I don't care what your design is sacral or non-sacral just because you're a non-sacral doesn't mean you get to charge more because you have to take less clients oof uh we hope to have her on the podcast soon Kiara if you're listening Kiara <laughs> wrote an amazing Substack <laughs> article about this I'm gonna write a note to myself to link it in the show notes yeah, just but because you don't have this regenerative battery that we have as sacrals doesn't mean you get to charge four times as much for a reading. Um, it's not our, it's not the public's job to pay you for your lack of definition. They pay you for your mastery, right? And this is probably going to stir up some shit and I'm not pointing a finger at any one person. I'm just saying like, there is a lot of taken advantage of happening and I just hope that if you're listening to this podcast, you understand that if you really want people to have access to their, like understanding their differentiation, that you can see how putting up a huge paywall can be very prohibitive to people who, you know, want readings. And then they might put certain people on a pedestal because they think that, oh, this person charges this really high amount. They must be the best when there are IHDS analysts charging $150 who have been doing readings for 20 years who are hands down better and they won't go to them because they see that price and they want that shiny object. They think that's better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Kiara's article, she talked about how she's, she's a projector and she talked about how other projectors in the space kind of pumped her up by saying, you know, you're a projector. This is your birth rate to guide generators. You're non-sacral. You should be charging $200 an hour when 
Kiara didn't have any experience doing it yet. And she's a three five, so she's got a trial and error through it. And it was just really bold of her and refreshing to read something where somebody's being totally honest and saying, you know what, I need to practice at this more. This takes practice. I'm going to lower my prices so I can get practice at this. And, you know, when you do an analyst training or like IHDS, in my perspective, is not like amazing (laughs) for everybody. It might be amazing for some people, but we're not saying that you have to be like IHDS certified in order to be able to deliver a good reading at all. But I, I we're saying that we understand why they tried to create standards and tried to have their students like cap prices to where if you're getting a foundation reading from an IHGS practitioner, you're getting the same product essentially as coming through a different person, but you know that you're paying the same amount for the same product. And yeah. I just think money is such a weird thing, especially in like the coaching and practitioner space, because there's no standards. I feel like in mm-hmm. the therapy world, there's more standards. Like it depends on what city you live in. I know because like a therapy session in New York is probably way more expensive than a therapy session in Des Moines, but there are at least like standards for that city probably. Mm-hmm. And you're going to have like a price range that you're working with where you're like, okay, I know I'm probably not going to pay more than this to work with a therapist. And in the coaching space, it's just like people can charge like two thousand dollars for right. one session or whatever. Right. And and I will say it, it's on the person to do that due diligence. To it's it's hard because I go back and forth because I'm like on one hand I totally get where you're coming from and I've been taken advantage of before and I've paid money for shit that was not the value, but mm-hmm. that was a lesson that I needed to learn so I could understand perceived value isn't always the value and how marketing can be really, really great and pull you in. And then you're not actually getting what you paid for, what you thought you were going to get, you know? And because there's no licensure or governing board in the coaching world, there's nothing telling people what to do or holding people accountable. And you Mm -hmm. can just block somebody, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. or you could just be like, no, sorry, no refunds. Mm -hmm. And I've, that's never happened to me, but that's happened to a bunch of my friends where somebody has an absolutely no refund policy. And let's say that they, they bought a package and they just like, don't drive with the practitioner. And they're like, you know, I just don't think this is a good fit. Like I did two sessions with you and I don't think it's a good fit. Can I have a refund? And they're like, absolutely not. You know, and I get it. There's people have businesses to run, but I hear something like that. And I'm like, I would, I would absolutely refund the person 100%. if it just wasn't a good fit. Like to me, yes. that's against my own personal ethics. Yes. But again, I don't want to project my ethics onto somebody else. So right. that's where you as a listener or a consumer discerning really has to be discerning of marketing and of big promises that are being made and knowing your authority and you know just because somebody is designed a certain way doesn't mean that they're going to give you what your mind thinks they're going to give you um yeah it's a tough discussion i'm going to be honest i don't think there's like a right answer but i understand you wanting to maybe protect people from grifter type yeah. of people because there are people that are out there just to make a quick buck you know absolutely and you know, I know for both you and I, Teresa, we have so many certifications and and skill sets that we bring to sessions with us. We don't even really call them human design readings because I we both look at the chart holistically and we have, you know, somatic training, you have parts work training, I have energy medicine training. We have so many different, we do muscle testing. So a session with me is the cost that it is because I incorporate all of those things. It's not, I'm not just going through your human design chart. You know, sometimes I don't even talk to people about their human design chart. I just pull it up so I can see some stuff to give me data to help with the one-on-one session that I'm in with somebody. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't want to sound too riled up (laughs) on on this episode. Also, I feel like um, you and I refer out a lot we yes like if we get somebody that we think is a better fit or somebody else and yeah. I'm gonna be honest with you guys I didn't always feel that way because I used to be a lot more broke and a lot more <laughs> desperate for money I'm not gonna yeah. lie I mm-hmm. I I feel like my ethics have changed so much over the last 
four years because of what I've seen, what I've learned, what I've felt and experienced myself. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to act like I'm the best and I'm a perfect person and I've never fucked up. Like I started doing readings way too soon. If I could go back and do it again, I would not have been doing readings. I was not qualified to be doing them when I first started doing them from my now standards. And the reason I did is because I had personal training clients asking me to sit down with them and talk about it. So then I was like, oh, well, people are asking for this. So I guess I can do this. You know, I can mm-hmm. make money doing this. Mm-hmm. And I think before I, I may have gotten a client or that I should have probably referred out that I was underqualified to take, Yeah, you know, yeah. and I'm sorry for that. <laughs> yeah. I, I've learned better and I've learned that you're not always the person that somebody needs. Right. Uh, just the other day, Andy, one of the guys that he knows, um, reached out to him and said, Hey, you know, I'd like to have a human design reading with Brandy and this guy's a projector. And I said, "Mm, send me his chart. I I need his details. I need to see who, you know, where I should refer him to. Like, I'm, that's just not, I'm, I'm a no, you know? And I think it's important too, as you know, people with human design knowledge, however much you've studied, if you're doing any sort of readings to know when you're not the right fit and kind of know when you're just chasing dollars versus handing people over information about their differentiation that could totally change the trajectory of their life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've, I mean, to be honest, I really like having a job that isn't just human design or my business income because I feel like I'm going through a bit of a shift personally right now and when you have a business that's completely tied to you and you rely off of that for your livelihood 100% you might not have the best ethics or you might I'm trying to think of a way to say this I feel like when people are desperate to live, they might do things that are not necessarily in the best interest of the client. Well, going back to keeping up, you know, you have a lifestyle that you have to keep up. Mm -hmm. So you have to figure out a way to keep it up. Yeah, which might be screwing over somebody, Mm -hmm. even if it's not a good fit or whatever. And I personally, right now at this point in my life, I like the comfort of having income from a different source so that I can be picky in my business and I can get people to where they want to go or where they need to go with the right person. And that I can also just do the types of sessions that I want to do and not just do something because I need the money. Right. I had somebody, uh, this was like a year and a half ago, who reached out and was like, I'm saving money to do a session with you. It's like $150. You know, and I'm almost there. And I said, oh, no, no, schedule it now, $100. That's it. Like, for the intention, like, recognize that there are people saving up and they might be trying to save up more than they can afford to have a reading with somebody because they see the price point is way high and they think that's better. And that just doesn't feel good Mm -hmm. for me. It's just me. Again, it's a tricky subject. And I can understand how people could be like, well, the investment, you know, if people aren't invested in it, they might not take it seriously. And and I I totally understand all of that. There Mm -hmm. should be an exchange. Um, I'm with you. I wish, I know this is not possible, but I wish there was a standard of pricing, you know, to where people know, okay, I'm not going to pay more than $200 for like a foundational intro introduction session. Yeah. with somebody or whatever because I, to me I'm like why do you need to pay more than that I don't know yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't if it's gonna be just that yeah I mean mm-hmm. but that's just us you know there's plenty of people that will happily pay whatever the price tag is if they love that person and if they really connect with that person and if that's the case that's fine yeah, I'm not I'm not even taking one-on-one clients right now. So it's not even that's just my choice because I'm too busy with other things. But um mm-hmm. <laughs> just mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. What well, chaps my ass, our new segment. <laughs> <laughs> Just know where we stand on that. Oh, there was a, there was a post too. Um, I can't remember who posted it, but it was really good talking about, um, oh, I want to dig it up. Can I pull it up? Sure. Let me see. Okay. You found the post. I found the post. Um, it's from Radical Authentish. And this is not going into the pop HD conversation, all of that, but one of the slides on a post that she had made, it says, why are we not talking about the harmful consequences of HD mentors with no background in coaching, communication, or psychology supporting clients in their deconditioning, a deeply vulnerable process, which can severely impact mental health especially with clients with pre-existing conditions like depression or anxiety. Oof. Oof. And with that, Teresa and I are very passionate about all of those things and, you know, um, trauma training and things like that. And there've been lots of conversations in the HD space where people will say, you don't need any of that. You just need human design. Um, Oh, that really traps my ass. (laughs) In my own personal process of deconditioning, if I did not have the skill sets that I have for myself or have people in my network that I could reach out to, to help me through that, um, and that were, you know, trained in those areas, uh, I probably wouldn't have made it as smoothly as I did. Strategy and authority led me to those people, you know? Um, and to think that there might be people out there giving readings and just sending people out with no awareness of basic things that are mentioned in that post, communication, psychology, coaching, um, that can be very damaging. Yeah. I mean... Yeah. Trauma is a factor. Absolutely. It is. I I know that a lot of human design folks want to act like it's not and shove it under the rug and say, all you need is strategy and authority. But sometimes there needs to be almost pre-deconditioning that you mm-hmm. do before you start really looking into your chart and uh, radically following strategy and authority, there might need to be stuff that you need to move through, or maybe it'll just naturally come up as you move through it. But if you're with a practitioner that doesn't know how to meet you there, and the only thing they have in their pocket is strategy and authority, well, I don't know. I, I, I get it because on one hand, human design practitioners, we're here to deliver the information. We're here to give a reading if we're giving a reading, you know, um, I know not all human design practitioners consider themselves coaches. Well, here's the thing. There are people out there that aren't just delivering a reading that yeah. are also saying that these things are not important. Yes. And that's the problem. That are taking you know, people through. If like you're a- doing more than just delivering a reading, then you need to have some acceptance. Or, and Yeah. Or at least Ooh. have people in your network to refer yes. out to yes. that do have awareness of this stuff or a therapist that, you know, even yes. I recognize my pitfalls. I am absolutely not qualified to take every type of client. And even when I do certain things like parts work, you know, I'm like, these are the contraindications mm-hmm. that I would not recommend it for these type of people. It's, I think people have to really know what they're getting themselves into with any type of um, exercise yeah. or process and human design is a process and if you're not in a mentally I don't want to how do I say this like if you're not in the right space to take it in it could do more harm than good yeah yeah Mm. well we just got real serious that recommending and referring to other people like cut the shit with the guru complex in human mm-hmm. design. You can't help everybody. You can't fix everybody. You don't need to. And they don't need to only go to you. I I mean, I deal with this in my regular business, right? That inner space. Like this is what it's built on, is that not one person's the same, not one thing is for everybody, not one mm-hmm. belief is for everybody. 
So we have people set up in places for what they need. And I refer out to other businesses constantly. This might be a hot take too, but Mm. some people live in an echo chamber. Oh. And as somebody who was raised by a psychologist, and I've also read books on this, um, there's actually a really good book I'm reading right now called You Should Talk to Someone, and it's a memoir by a therapist. So it's a really good read if you just want to like have an eye into what the therapy world is. Um, but my father, psychologist, he met with a men's group every single week for the last my entire life. So for the last 34 years, he's been meeting with these guys. There are other therapists. And the reason, and most therapists, I won't say this isn't required, but most therapists do have these meetings with other therapists. And you know what they do in those meetings? They talk about their clients, uh, not obviously by name, they keep it confidential, but they talk about the other therapists will call them out on their shit. Yep. If there's, they'll tell them what's going on in the sessions. I can't help this person. I don't know what's going on. And sometimes they'll straight up say, well, you're not the right therapist for them, or you have this bias and that's preventing your client from moving forward. And I think what people have to realize when they're working with a practitioner, like, and this is something that's like, again, it's a tough subject. I know I'm a practitioner. I know I'm a coach. I am not a therapist, but there are certain things that therapists have in place that keep them honest and keep them humble that coaches just don't, unless they go out of their way to create that. Yes. Mm-hmm. And if you are just surrounded by people that are pumping you up all the time, like again, Kiara's article is such a good example of this. She was just surrounded by people that were pumping her up that weren't telling her the truth of what it is to do sessions with people and what can come up with people. And what do you do if you're just not vibing with somebody and the information that you're giving them isn't landing and you know, all kinds of things that can come up. What if the person gets defensive and they don't want to take in the information or what if it's just not a good fit? Right. Or what if your own biases are preventing that person from really seeing their design or seeing themselves? And what do you do if your person that you're in a session with and you're explaining like some theme around a center and they just drop a childhood trauma bomb on you? How is you as a practitioner, how can you handle that? Can you? How are you going to handle it if they go into a trauma response all of a sudden? Absol- do you because understand? Because of something you said. Do you know what it looks like when somebody goes into a trauma response? Do you know what happens to their eyes, to their face? Do you know what happens? And again, Brandy and I aren't saying this to be like, we know everything. We're the best. It's no. because I've been in this situation yes. before. And this yes. is why I got more training because yes. I fucked up and I wasn't ready for what could happen yeah. when you start giving people this very deep information. Yep. Mm-hmm. I was completely unqual. I started doing um, energy medicine and like muscle testing and whatnot. And I was like, working with people and most of the time it was fine and then one time I had this client that went full on into a trauma response and I didn't know what to do and that's I got freaked out and I was like I need to learn more I need to buy books on trauma this is not okay can you handle if somebody goes into a catatonic state on a zoom call of a foundation reading or or not even not just but not foundation I'm talking about beyond in a session where you're going into more depth do you know what to do and this might be hard for some people to hear because i know it was hard for it was hard for me to accept so i can empathize with anybody that's maybe struggling to hear this and is maybe and like for me i was somebody who already doubts my abilities i already doubt what the fuck i'm doing and whether i'm qualified i've thought about going back to school multiple times i i got into graduate school to go be a therapist and it just wasn't right for me. So for whatever reason, this is the path that I'm on. And I know how hard this might be for some of you to hear if you are a practitioner and you don't feel like you are qualified. And to that, I say, take that shame that you might be feeling and turn it into action Mm -hmm. or turn. If you really want to be doing this work, if you're really dedicated and there are sources that you can go find um what's the place that we took i'm my brain is the embody lab we did body somat- lab somatic attachment therapy training they have sliding scale they have a f- like payment plans they have online classes that you can go take that will at least give you the foundational basics so that you'll know to identify this and to, to refer out or 
to be able to at least handle it in the moment if it happens. I think it's incredibly valuable to at least have that type of foundational training. Or ask people in your network, you know, hey, do you know somebody that I could have coffee with and talk about these things or anybody have book idea, like any books I can read on this, just these surface level things. So you have this awareness instead of just like plowing through. Yeah. Cause again, I feel like sometimes, and this is exactly what happened to me. You know, I took Jenna Zoe's training and she's like, cool, you guys can go do readings now after one weekend. <laughs> again, I've come to terms with it. I I'm fine with that whole situation, but those are some of the pitfalls with doing a weekend training. And then the person is telling you you're good to go do a reading now. Yeah. Oh, I just and posted a reel on this this morning. I didn't even realize we were going to talk about this, but it was like after your two day certification that you go do, and now you can like lay hands on people and do energy work. And again, it's like people just wanting to make a quick buck. Yeah. Yeah. And it also could be people like whose hearts are in the right place. They do want to help people. Yes. They just don't realize the reality. And that's kind of was it what it was for me. It was like, I really want to help people. I love working with people. I'm a 659. I just mm. I just love people in that way. I I love really hard and I I'm passionate about it. And yet there were certain things I just didn't know and I didn't know how to handle it. And I had to be really honest with myself about that. Yeah. Same. Absolutely. I mean, I'm not going to lie. There are parts of that, that, I mean, I have been studying all of these other things for 10 plus years. And there's still part of me that because I'm aware of it, how it could be detrimental. Sometimes I tread lightly with certain things and with sessions in sessions with people. And I have a list a mile long of people that I can refer to and what I would notice in a client and what, how I can or cannot help them when I have to say, I cannot help you. We need, you know, we can't go there. If you want to go there, here's that person that can go there with you. We need to turn and go left instead of right. And having the confidence to be able to do that. And you know what that's going to do is have them trust you more, that you actually have their best interest in mind and not just money. Mm -hmm. or not going out and being like, oh, okay, I can't help you with that, but hold on, let me go get um a two-day certification on that and then we'll schedule an appointment for Monday and I can help you with that. Right. <laughs> let me still be your, come back to me, you know, trapping people. Mm -hmm. Come back to me. No, I can help you with that. Or I'll just go take a, what is that place? Uh, Udemy, where you could take like a 45 minute, <laughs> like $10. 40 minute, yeah, I'll be right back. I'm going to go take a integration specialist certification in 45 minutes and then we'll reconvene and I'll be able to help you with that. And I don't want to say that therapists are better than coaches or whatever. I mean, I just, I know there's therapists out there that at least from from what I've been told from certain clients that have had really bad experiences with therapists. So I don't want to yeah. say this is like just a, if this is just like a person thing and you just know when you're going to work with a therapist that there's a board that's watching over this person. So it's different. Yeah. You know, you just have to be a little more mindful when you're signing up with a practitioner and I don't know. I mean, I'm a fourth line, so I really only work with people that are through my network that I've had Same. other people vouch for. Yeah. And I don't care so much. I don't really care about certifications or anything like that because I'm like, well, if my friend went to them and they liked them, that's good enough for me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which has also not always worked out, but most of the time, 90% <laughs> of the time it works every time. <laughs> or 60% of the time it works every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I have my business partner at inner space is a therapist and she has tons of letters and tons of certifications. And she's always constantly taking different trainings and she'll even sometimes come out from like a, a client and be like, yeah, I had to refer them away. I can't help them anymore. Yeah. You know, that's what I'm saying. I feel like the thing is, I feel like therapists for whatever reason, in my experience, have no problem doing that. Right. Whereas in the coaching community, it doesn't seem it's like people want to hang on to clients and because they have to hang on to them because that's the money, you know, oof, we always come back to the that, money. It's the money. Well, if, if you go away, then I don't have that money. Mm -hmm. 
And like, if the pr- I've had things happen where and money's not bad, by the way. No, I'm it's just... not. Yeah, money's not bad. Yeah. No, no, no. And wanting to have money is not bad. And wanting to charge a certain price for your time and wanting to get paid for your energy that is not bad. Nope. We're just saying be aware of these discrepancies that exist yeah. out there. And yeah. And again, I think that's such a unique journey that we all have to go on. I hate to use that word, but like it's a journey <laughs> to well, understand the value of something. I think too, for Teresa and I, since we carry provocation, um, we're extra aware that we are just carrying that frequency, right? So what is that going to do? I have no idea, mm-hmm. but I need to be aware of what it's going to do when it happens, you know, or aware of which direction to go when I can sense that somebody has been provoked instead of just going in there and be like, sorry, that's my design provocation. Mm -hmm. So you're just going to have to deal with it. And whatever happens after that's not my responsibility, but I'm also super tribal and I could never allow that. (laughs) Probably provoking quite a few people on this podcast today. (laughs) Oops. Our our intro says a dash, and today it's more like a, a um, heaping spoonful, <laughs> or a, get out the hose of provocation, yeah, hose. <laughs> shovel of provocation. <laughs> I just think it's important to talk about this stuff. I I feel like before I had a this is so weird to say out loud, but before I had another source of income, I was nervous to talk about this stuff because I'm going to be honest, I thought it was going to like affect people's perception of me or of human design or of the coaching space. And I've had these thoughts and feelings for a while. I'm, I just didn't know how to talk about it and how to deliver it. And I also, you know, as a fourth line, I know lots of people that are in all kinds of categories of practitioner and whatever. And I don't want to harm those relationships or people to think I'm talking about them necessarily. It's just this is stuff that I see going on and stuff that I've felt myself. And I think when um, you don't tie or when you're not tied a hundred percent to something for your livelihood, you can just be a lot more honest about it. And objective. And objective. Yeah. And I'm in that space right now where I'm like, I'm actually getting to evaluate what I want this to look like for myself and how I want to do this and how I can do this with morals and ethics and the right way. And I'm seeing some of what other folks are doing and I don't agree with it and that's fine. They can do whatever they want, but I don't, I don't want to run my business that way. And so I think when, when you do have your own business and you're working as a practitioner, you have to go through that period of seeing what other people are doing and maybe doing that for a bit and being like, well, other people are doing it so I can do it. And then seeing how that feels for you and being like, I don't, I don't really know if I want to do that. That doesn't feel right for me. And let's circle back, you know, and it's just like this constant refining process. And so I just want to be totally transparent and be like, this is where I'm at. And this is how I feel about things. And there's some things I'm kind of unsure about and rightfully so, you know, and you've always mentioned this to me, business is a third line. It's you're always trial and error. You're always experimenting. So if you're a business owner, entrepreneur, and you're listening to this, there's no shame. Just it's, we experiment just Mm -hmm. like with human design. And for me personally, being in my experiment for as long as I have and experiencing what I have, I feel this duty and my definition, (laughs) feel this duty to protect and preserve the system and preserve people that are entering into or exploring and experimenting with the system because human design is fucking amazing. If it it's so accurate and it can help us express how we were born to express and exude all of our brilliance and our uniqueness and we get to just shine and we can live in our signatures live with peace and success and satisfaction and surprise and I want everybody to experience their signature and if there are things out there that can be detrimental to people experiencing that like I feel a responsibility to say something Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I feel like it's very zeitgeisty these days to just be like, you do you or to each their own. And those are things I say yeah. all the time. Uh, but it's also like, how can you, ha yeah, have that perspective that people are going to do what they want to do to yeah. each their own. Yeah. And also there's got to be some people standing on their ethics and standing on their morals and expressing those. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think that's a good closing for today. I think so too. Well, thank you for listening to Human Design Coffee Talk. As always, we love hearing your feedback, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on Spotify or want to talk to us on our Instagram, which is at Human Design Coffee Talk. Shoot us a message. Yeah. And in the show notes, we will drop um, some resources for either um, some books that we love on around the topics that we talked about, um, you know, resources and body lab, things like that. So we'll, we'll make sure we include some of those for you guys in case you don't have anybody to reach out to for any of that. Thanks for being here. Thank you.